changes the agenda. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, there's an added item of communication from Mr. Tom Fonte respecting his experience regarding the process to convert 12 Pat Street from Mass back to residential zoning. The correspondence is added as item 5.1A and copies have been distributed. Also, a clarification is required with respect to the agenda. Appendix A to item 6.1 is actually report TD01104F respecting the business license review which was referred from the planning committee. Therefore, the recommendations outlined in appendix X, sorry, appendix A, require the subcommittee's consideration. And staff have requested that an amendment be made to the recommendations to add a new subsection E. Copies of the amendment have been distributed. I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended. Pierce? I can see no letter. Is there? A letter? A memo? Okay, I don't have one. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, it should be. Yeah, we'll have a direction on that item. It's 5.1A and we'll have a direction on that, Councillor. So on the motion moved by Pierce and seconded by Pasuda to approve the agenda as amended. All's in favor? Opposed? The motion's carried. Are there any declarations of interest? Item 6.1 is one item there in the tax licensing. Thank you, Councillor. You have before you our minutes of the August the 16th. Are there any errors or omissions? If not, I have a motion to approve the minutes of that date. Moved by Ferguson. Seconded by Pearson. On the motion, all those in favor? Carried. We have no consent items. On item 5.1, I'd like to call upon Chris Phillips to present item 5.1 regarding the preliminary findings and open for business action plan. This report will outline 15 areas of which there are 68 action items involved. Mr. Phillips? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Debbie and I are going to do the presentation jointly. I believe there's a handout of the printed. We're going to go through a quick PowerPoint. Obviously, you've got the substantial document in front of you as well. And I think after we do the overview, we can then, whatever committees, whether you want to go line by line through the report. So we'll just kind of give you a bit of an overview here first. And during the presentation, if there's any questions, just stop me and we'll ask the question right at that point. Fair enough. Same with staff. So big picture on the overview. Just want to kind of take us back one step as to how we got here. Because this report, I think, is a culmination of a lot of the effort from this subcommittee over the course of the past 11 months or so. And specifically, we're going to review some of the background. We're going to kind of review some of the actions and summary findings of the specific report itself. And then section three is really a highlight of the separate recommendations that we've kind of grouped into different things. So the first is that we formally established this committee just over a year ago on November 11th, 2011. And since that time, we've had 11 meetings of the joint subcommittees that have taken place over that whole span. As part of the terms of reference, we had an entire public consultation process that that committee considered and directed staff on which we had two specific days that we had sessions, April 11th and 25th, of which 15 or so organizations made formal presentations at the subcommittee. As well as we've had a range of feedback, including the letter that continues to come as correspondence from groups, from organizations, both those that were there and presented in the 15 and those that maybe weren't. And specifically, we came back in June, on June 13th to the subcommittee, with an overall document that really tried to summarize all the delegations' feedback. We then took that and we morphed it into another report that you saw and endorsed back in August. And this slide here basically is the direction that we were given in August from subcommittee, which generally speaking endorsed the elements that were contained in the report. 
uh, that you directed us to then uh, prepare formal reports of those recommended actions that are related to bylaws and things that other subcommittees needed to do. That you asked us to prepare a detailed work plan for implementation, and then we extended the deadline of, of written submissions till September 15th. All in all, we believe, that, and it's our uh, our recommendation that this is exactly what's before you today. Follows the direction that we've uh, we've kind of outlined here, and in that kind of series. So, I wanted to give you an idea of how we came to be with this document that we're in. Debbie's going to kind of go through. Uh, the actual recommendations that, that are contained in the actual plan itself. So it's just, um, I'm just going over a very high level overview and I just wanted to walk you through how we got to this current attachment um, and where we left off in August. So we had um, about 15 categories, so we have all the same categories. The only new category that we added was technology and so we just took mostly, there was a few items under customer service that actually were more technology focused. So we just broke it out, it was easier for us to organize. Um, if you recall, the previous report, um, we responded directly to each individual comment or suggestion that the public or the delegation had raised. So it was a kind of a Q&A, so we had staff recommendations and then staff comments. So not all of the recommendations would actually require actions. Um, and then the public delegation summary, Again, it provided us with an opportunity to um, educate or increase awareness um, or provide some clarity around why we do the things that we do. So again, those may not um, translate into a specific action either. So that's why you're seeing um, less action items, if you will, in this attachment than you did um, previously. So um, again, if you're wondering where some of uh, some of the items are, I'm capturing some of the uh, omissions um, from the previous report. So in some cases, again, they were recommending actions or services that we actually already offer. So they were suggesting, for example, why don't you have a one point of contact? Who could walk me through the planning process? Well, we already have that. So we wouldn't carry that through into an action item because it already exists. Same thing with um, publicly available standards and processes. Those already exist on our website. Um, so most of those will actually be captured in communications and promotion. So they exist, just now our responsibility to make sure that those are communicated and that the businesses know where they can find these resources. The other is some of the recommendations would have been just collapsed into one action instead of having several ones. So the holding bylaw, we moved that into residential intensification. There was two action items related to HCA policies. Again, we combined it into one. And there were several items that spoke to timelines in all different areas. So again, we just combined those. And then some of the items would have been entirely removed. The example of that was there was a request for more flexibility with site visits or having site visits in general, and staff already do that. So the building already come out um, to visit in terms of the building inspections. Licensing would come out, public health would come out, and so on in terms of the licensing process. Fast tracking, um, we decided uh, to remove that one because the direction, again, in the previous report was that um, if we did offer a fast tracking option, that would become the norm, and it would still, we'd still have the same um, timelines in terms of processing. Uh, changes to daycare facility requirements, moratorium on enforcement, um, requirements for drawings, um, those uh, we can't do anything uh, with because they're municipal, provincial, or federal legislation. So again, those would have been ones where we communicated with um, the, uh, the business owner, uh, the businesses that, for example, we can't have a moratorium on businesses. Our bylaw says we need to, um, to enforce that. So those were, um, those were the ones that got eliminated. I won't uh, read all these out, these are the categories, and again, you'll see them reflected in the appendix. And then, I uh, just wanted to provide you with a general summary in terms of um, what is in this, uh, this attachment here. So, 69 um, action items, 16% have already been completed. Um, 32 are on our short-term list, so those will be completed by Q2 2013. 36 um, are medium term, they will be Q4, most are actually um, by Q3 2013. 8% are long term, um, 2014, I think there's maybe one in 2015. 
And then eight, we kind of categorize as ongoing. There's a lot of things that we do on a regular basis, whether it's annual reporting um, or it's updating of our website or communications uh, plan. In terms of the long-term initiatives, those ones are all technology-based uh, in terms of the long-term long based on Amanda or online applications and approvals. So we'll be tied to, say, the website, for example. Um, and not, uh, not surprising, but most of the action items, um, or the one that category that had the most, would be customer service, even though we separate from technology that had the most items on our list. And then some of the other things were are important to highlight were there are obviously corporate impacts, um, and one is um, that there's a, a few of the items on here that we will be relying on support from other uh, departments. Uh, so, for example, corporate services, uh, letters of credits, our um, development charges, we, um, we're working with uh, finance, um, and public health, the last two action items are the public health inspections. And then the website, uh, which is um, technology, and then the web redevelopment team. So those are other areas. Budget impact, so there's, of all of these 69 items, there's no immediate financial impact. Um, some of the actions um, will deal with assessing staff um, in 2013, which we may need to request in 2014, but there's no budget impacts for 2013. And then pass back to Chris. So then uh, the recommendations that are contained specifically in the report um, are uh, what we tried to do is, uh, is put a real um, bulk of the information in the appendix. And because we've done that, We've, we've uh, kind of categorized the recommendations for you in a specific way. Um, the first two recommendations really deal with your enforcement of, of the document and all the actions that are listed within the document, as well as the direction <coughs> for us to go and start putting these in our uh, di divisional and uh, sort of departmental work plans, uh, as well as the divisional work plans themselves for the 2015. Um, recommendation C deals with a specific recommendation out of, out of the document, uh, item 1.5, which basically formalizes this staff group that we've been working with over the last 11 months. Uh, we felt as staff that this is a, uh, it's been a great venue, and we thought that what we do is carry on with this and formalize it in nature. Therefore, that's the recommendation C. Uh, D uh, talks specifically to items of the website. We spoke about this in August in the report. But the fact that the, uh, uh, the website has its own corporate team going on, uh, so those items 8491 and 93 all deal with the website, and we're looking to, uh, uh, to refer those items to the corporate strategy team. So you said Maria now? No, or sorry, I think I just wanted to turn it Item E, I believe, was actually dealt with yesterday to, to some degree, but basically the fee review element, that uh, the recognition that fees are being dealt with again corporately through other processes and that, that be referred to, to that item. And then finally, F and G really deal with the future of this subcommittee and the future agenda. Um, during, the, uh, during the process of putting this report together, uh, staff have looked at the outstanding business list, we've looked at all items we've covered plus the previous list. Uh, elements, and we compared it against the terms of reference as established at the very beginning of, of this process. And we deemed as staff that, uh, that the terms of reference on the deliverables that were asked of, that this report, if and when approved today, um, basically completes the elements that were contained in the draft uh, terms of reference. And that, uh, so therefore we, we uh, asked for that on F. And G is basically kind of looking forward and making a recommendation to the subcommittee uh, that you may want to uh, look at uh, continuing the mandate itself of the, of the subcommittee and potentially arranging a biannual basis or on the call of the chair as to us moving forward. So that sums up the uh, overview. Maria? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and certainly I appreciate the um, the sort of the synopsis of everything in the action plan. Um, I'm really glad of where we're coming because that was an awful lot of work when we began this. Thinking, how are we going to funnel all these into, I don't want to say silos, but funnel them so that we do create the efficiencies that we needed to. And I'm really pleased that 
everybody who sat around this table over the whole time period certainly went back to the clear and loud message of um, you know, making it more customer friendly, making it more efficient, and uh, we have to remember that it's the residents that are, you know, that are the ones that are working to and um, so on. So I'm really pleased. I, I wanted to just make some points on the um, on the action plan on the whole the larger document. One point of contact. Uh, are we at that point now where everybody is one point of contact for you, you Mr. Chairman? Um, I'd say yes, we are as it relates to the business facilitation process, specifically in our one-stop uh, center downstairs. I, I think uh, some of the delegates, if we go back to what some of them were asking for. I think they were looking for one point of contact throughout the entire process. I think that if we were kind of to, to review that, it just depends on where you fit in the process and at what entry point. And certainly I welcome anyone else to, to, uh, to respond if they thought. Um, if you go through the one stop, and you continue to establish and have that one point of contact. But if somebody goes directly to Ed's uh, division by just walking into the third floor or somebody goes directly to planning and they then have to deal with other processes, they, they will still find that they may, have, may have to deal with other people. But I think the crux of it is we're offering a service that allows a customer to have a single point of contact if they so choose. Excellent. And I know I've circled a number of things here, Mr. Chairman, but I, I'm, I'm confident that by what's being said here today, everybody who attended this Put together that these will work. I'm really pleased at the, the suggestion at the beginning of uh, ongoing training for staff. I, I have to admit, I mean, my complaints as far as uh, licensing and that, I have one right now, but I mean, the complaints of that have diminished greatly. Um, but I see on the other side that it's bylaw enforcement and it's bylaws that we need to know that our officers know the bylaws. It's pretty bad when the counselor calls, sends off an email about something and is told, no, no, it's fine, they just need a permit, it's not fine. I let them know it has to be signed by laws. And I expressed that the staff said, no, we'll check the bylaw because a third party sign on the building is not allowed. So that's being addressed. So it's, it's just a matter of making sure that our staff know what the rules are. And if they don't, be careful before they send off an email. Because it's not just that it could come to a counselor, it could be going to another resident. But if you put in a complaint, and that doesn't send a good message either. So there's a number of just little tweaks or whatever, but I'm really pleased of where things are coming and uh, how, far, how far things have gone. Thank you. Frugal Roy, did you want to talk about the, the point of contact? Uh, from just add on to the. To, to the question raised by Councillor Pearson. Sure, I think I think the one-stop contact in itself is working fabulously well. I think anybody who's had a chance to walk by sees how busy those counters are on a daily basis. And when something comes through there, it's very easy for our staff to facilitate that conversation and continue that relationship building with those constituents within our community. Um, so it's very important that we continue to drive volume through the one-stop so that we can be proactive and helping those businesses as they uh, have questions, concerns, and they, they know they can always come back to that point of contact as well. Yes. One of the things that I've seen is once we've started this process and that, and obviously with, with uh, Debbie's outreach and telling people about you know, this community happening and, and what we're doing is the number of people who are taking advantage of our, uh, of our one-stop shopping location they didn't know before. We, We've evolved some uh, new materials to get that message out, and we're, uh, we're doing some, some self-promotion of that. So I think just from the fact of letting people know we're live and well and what service we provide uh, in, uh, in, in print media, and uh, uh, I'm going to call it the approved, uh, approved presence on uh, your webpage, not the city's webpage, that uh, um, uh, it's improved, and, and your numbers, I'm sure, will be anxious to hear your numbers compared to the uh, to the previous year uh, when we get into the next year. Okay. Councilor Ferguson. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. I'm going to start with Christian Tudor. When we started this process, you made five very interesting areas that frustrate you. Have they been fixed? I believe so. Uh, we've had a lot of collaboration within the departments. Uh, we've seen a lot of improvement in our communication, and we're hearing from the community that it's working. Okay, so your staff are not frustrated now, is it? I don't believe so. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. Second, second point I want to make is uh, 
Yeah, this is a good report, and it, it summarizes very nicely what we've been able to accomplish. Um, one thing, uh, and maybe it's covered under um, resource and tools at 1.8, but I don't think so. We had a, a spirited discussion about whether or not when somebody shows up at our small business and they come back through licensing and back through building, we need a, an engineering report, we need a, you know, some kind of report, an outside expert, that we would have a list of people that do that stuff. I guess our council has that all the time. Why have been asked to get a, an architect's stamp on this thing, and I don't want a clue to call. I, I grow potatoes, or I cook french fries, or I, you know, cook burgers. I don't have a clue to call. Who should I call? Are we going to do that? Uh, three, Mr. Chair, the, the, the easy answer, the quick answer is no. Uh, one of the reason why you don't see it on here is that the staff have discussed it. Uh, we were not able to land on a on, on, a, on a product that would actually be, uh, would make sense for the customer and make sense uh, from our own liability standpoint here. Uh, so we, we, we say no to that as far as our recommendation. We leave it obviously to the subcommittee if you did. Um, the dilemma runs into, we, as you know, we, we did have a spirited debate. The debate continued at a staff level, I can tell you, uh, over numerous meetings. The trouble is that uh, if you try to be uh, as inclusive as I, I think we are all trying to be, uh, in order to not pick favorites, you'd end up with the telephone book. And if you narrow it down, uh, you run into how do we make the criteria to what what referrals we give to or not. As, as staff, we landed on a recommendation of not to. That's why it comes in. So, um, so some of the things that um, I know myself and one staff get questions like that, and so what I have been doing is I do refer them to the associations. There's two key associations. Um, and then I give almost tips in terms of and for example, building has tips for homeowners when you're looking at getting quotes for renovations. So similar type of thing. So we'll, we'll suggest to them, um, get three quotes, um, get quotes that are very similar. You're comparing apples to apples. Um, the other is make sure, um, or preferably if you can get someone who's worked with a business in Hamilton who has an understanding of our um, system and our processes, um, and then ask other people word of mouth so we give kind of an overview of tips, um, and uh, so we're trying to kind of balance, balance that approach um, and provide them with some guidance. We also include um, those kind of generic tips online and then also in some of our brochures as well. And then when staff have individual conversations, um, they again can lead them through, because yes, it's certainly overwhelming when you're, um, you know, you're kind of referred to a telephone book, but there, as Chris mentioned, there was the kind of back and forth in terms of the advantages and disadvantages. I know there's a huge list that we could compile, um, but it would be just as overwhelming, potentially, as the phone book, and that was, that was some of the challenge. Could, could, could you, just as you said, could you prepare for us, compile a list of the generic referrals that you've talked about in the questions and that. So in other words, do the Association of Professional Architects, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Hamilton, and the contact voice, I, I think that would be, at least helpful. Okay, I just I just worry we're pretending bureaucracy in the way of common sense. And, you know, we know who the good engineers are. And I'm not saying you have to just listen to good ones, but I, I think that we're we're doing a disservice to the public if we are going to be open for business by not helping them through the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy is I need an archaeological report. I need a geotechnic report. I need you know an instructional engineers report. Who the heck does that? And when you say to me, you ask me to get three quotes, they say, well, who should I call? Three quotes. How do you answer that? Well, in, and again, in that case, there are some, like, we do have, like, and maybe I can speak to this a bit more in terms of buildings. So we do have, with their, and you could actually look, I mean, it would spend a bit of time. Part of it is categorizing, right? So again, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know who does, whose specialty is what, just by the name of the business. Um, so that is that can be a challenge. And I believe that we did have a list that you could categorize the type of engineer, um, but I think that it was quite long. I don't know if you, Ed, if you want to. Yeah, maybe just to clarify that to make sure. Um, our experience is that when people ask for an engineer, they say, well, you've got three names, and call somebody. So you can share with 30 names. We know from our experience, maybe 29 of them are wonderful, more than awful. We have people come back to us and say, we gave me this person and it's just been a horrendous nightmare for me. 
one unit since our response to center. And we've seen good contractors and bad contractors. And it's a very difficult to disseminate good and bad. Well, we can disconnect it from this group. Yeah. And give an example I just said this morning where now water and wastewater is coming in, trying to help us solve this problem with these backwater levels and how to avoid all this money with putting up grants. And rather, they, they don't want the city to procure either for the liability. They can hear that all the time. And, and they're, so they're going to have a suggestion that you know, we get three quotes. The whole world gets three quotes because they the lowest one and we'll pay up to $2,000. Well, the obvious question for homeowners, who the heck does this? Can you give me some suggestions so I can get three quotes from them? They don't know who to call. And I said, why don't you just give them the list of licensed contractors to do this work in Hamilton? And oh no, we can't do that for liability reasons. And and I just I just worry this is a big problem to that small business person out there who's trying to get it right. So why why don't we uh, why don't we just why don't we flag this, Lloyd, and we'll have another discussion on this sooner. Okay, but I, I I'm seeing the recommendation today. This committee stands down now and only meets once every six months. Or at the call of the chair. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I'm curious if, if my other council colleagues are hearing the same thing from their constituents. I, I quite frankly will give recommendations. I'll so say, go with these guys. So do I. And, and, uh, and, well, okay, why not? And, you know, the lawyers are getting in the way of trying to be open for business. And, and I guess us as council to do that. So I'll take your advice. I'll back off and touch this. Just two other points. Um, great suggestions, great ideas. How do we measure that we're doing it? I don't see that in here anywhere. For example, how do we measure we're getting back to the 48 hours? Or we are turning around that application in four weeks? Because I'm sure hearing different things out there. But I don't know how to measure this. And, and, and just to find out, are we in fact meeting these new objectives, which are very aggressive, very good? But how do we know we're really doing it? Just can you supplement to that? I thought that may not, not try anyway. Share it out me. Is, uh, do we have any, um, um, we've gone through an extensive process, we've identified areas that uh, need uh, some attention to improvement, you've implemented some recommendations, you're still working on others. Um, one individual goes through these experiences, we, it was almost like a, a, an out survey or some way of uh, back to measuring. Uh, so we get a sense on the experience of individuals as we move down this, this road, uh, as they conclude their uh, their experience, experience uh, they could fill out a, a quick survey in regards to what their experience are what, and what they might suggest or recommend in the, in the context of uh, the challenges. So answer Councillor Ferguson and then Councillor Whitehead supplement. So uh, through, uh, through you, uh, Chair, um, uh, I think in 2-4, uh, we've tried to, uh, I think first of all, in the first, in the first bulk of the customer service and the communications and promotion section, We've, we've hit, I think, a bunch of these points. In 2-4, when we've tried to capture the idea that we do need to do a better job in monitoring and measuring. And, and I think that's ingrained all the way through the report, our elements of how do we track this, this stuff. Uh, and that is a key kind of underlying component to almost everything that's in here. I believe that it was actually several counselors, but I do remember Councilor Collins at the beginning of the process uh, asking about measurements and, and uh, yardsticks and then comparator municipalities as well as uh, Councillor Ferguson, you mentioned the idea of keeping our feet to the fire. How do we do that? So uh, I think the first part is just presenting it in this fashion and having the committee continue on uh, establishes the feet to the fire to where a subcommittee could actually say, where are we on issue two, four, six months from now or whatever. Um, but embedded in this, I think, is the recognition from ourselves. And it just so happened that we were undergoing the service delivery review as staff at the same time as we were doing this. And so all the directors around the table and their staff were also engaged in that whole process where we were defining uh, measurable on services as well. So we were doing it kind of at the same time. So embedded in this is the notion that we do have to monitor the thing. We have to establish what the measurements are and continue to monitor. So it, it's not something that's lost. I do think it's captured in here, uh, but certainly if you if you want to uh, enforce that to us, we certainly take that direction. So why don't we put that on an early agenda? Uh, if, we, if we, and I don't see the pages in the number, the one that says the open for business action, that summary of findings, 
is that the targets are is you know by the end of of, of uh, Q2, 32%. By the end of I'm going to call it the year or next year, 36%. So if, if we're able to put together some uh, um, KPIs early, then they can, if possible, to keep track of those numbers and report at the uh, at the end of. Uh, um, at the end of next calendar year, to see whether they've achieved that 36%. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I don't have a silver bullet on the measures of direct issues. I have a, you know, Scott was saying, of course I called him back before he got to see Of course, the person on the other end my phone was saying, I have six messages and nobody's got back to me yet. So I don't need a measure. I don't have an answer for them. Uh, you know, we constantly have problems with applications or in here, particularly around site plans. And, it seems like weeks and weeks and weeks, and, and of course, I'm not going to say, well, we're waiting for information from Africa. That was, they've had that now for three months, so I don't have a silver bullet on a measure. But why don't they wrap their head around it? We'll put it on a, a future, future agenda. agenda. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Whitehead, uh, on, on your supplementary, uh, did you see 2.4? Yeah, on the chart? I just think we should have a continuing so monitoring uh, the, the program, the success of the program, and continue improving. It's not a, something that's it's a, it's a organism. So uh, the way I look at it anyway. And the other question I was going to have. Sure, let me just Kristen, what's our scenarios on, ex I'm going to call them exit interviews? Sure. Uh, the Small Business Enterprise Center has an extensive follow-up process and a tracking process. So anybody who contacts through our center, we track that phone call. For example, we had a constituent call yesterday and say nobody got back to them. Well, I know that somebody got back to them at 9.03 a.m. Um, so we have that extensive tracking process when it comes in. So we can definitely track those coming through there. From a survey perspective, anybody who comes through the Small Business Enterprise Center is surveyed at month one after they've left us and at an annual basis as well. Where are you? How can we help you through this process? How can we stay engaged in this and help you continue to grow your business here in Hamilton? No. So we, we do have that in place. But you've always been fairly good at that anyway. I mean, I didn't find as, a, as much an issue in your areas, perhaps some of the other areas. So I'm, I'm more concerned about the macro versus. Okay. And my understanding is that some of uh, a lot of the good work that um, Kristen's group is doing is they're sharing that with the other areas in terms of the best practices. So again, they've got a lot of really good metrics. They've got a lot of um, good ways again of doing the follow up. It's a matter of passing that along to licensing, passing along to planning, passing along to building, and to make sure again there's consistency along the process, um, because measurements are are really important from that perspective. And this is a supplementary kind of sure, chair. sure. Uh, I don't know if this falls into the scope. It's, it's a recent experience with uh, some new entrepreneurs opened up business, and it's always a challenge at, at, at the front end on the capital side. Tick along, tick along, and you're looking what's a BMC or whatever they, they, they apply for funding. I just don't know if we do a good enough job uh, for an open business and for entrepreneurs and, and businesses uh, that are opening up shop here in Hamilton. Uh, in identifying all the different sources of financing that they, they can go to. Um, uh, that, if I get a complaint, and this guy, and I'm still working with them, uh, if there was a consistent complaint, uh, some will argue the kitchen does a heck of a lot better job, for example. Because uh, this guy's the second off, this is the second time we're on. So I'm trying to understand what the kitchen is doing different than us in regards to providing that, that, that resource. We're not bankers, I understand that, we don't have programs, and that's another uh, discussion for a different committee. But do we do a good enough job in, in really um, um, sort of looking for taking all the, all the, all the data and opportunities from all the different uh, financial institutions to venture capitalists to to whatever other private sector programs or our public sector programs out there. If we have like the bulk of it just highlights each and every one of those organizations contact numbers. For you, Mr. Chair, we have a resource um, downstairs where people coming in can say, I'm accessing funding, where do I get that? And it's check, check, check. Um, I'm surprised that we don't compare to Kitchener because that was actually the person that managed our center while I was off on that leave and she took our platform and took those resources to KW to implement there. So we should have very similar resources that way. Um, we have more resources here in Hamilton as well and we do have that comprehensive listing that people can get. 
the big part that we actually do with our clients when they come through the one stop is again educate them on which of those programs they do qualify for and some of those that they don't as well so as much as we have a comprehensive listing it's not eligibility to everybody but again we're proactive in making sure that they understand that they're here this is what we have and here who is eligible and how that process would then work Great. and i think the challenge in this case is that uh, two cases they're leasing now they're not, they're not buying although eventually they hope to grow up that they can buy but the challenge with leasing is trying to get the financing right. and yet the business can show that they're they're, they're, they're bringing profit mm -hmm. but they got to make an investment well, that's how, the challenge. how about helping us on the big big scene do we uh, provide direction or in most cases they've already got their ducks in a row uh, it, it's really dependent on the uh, on the company, Mr. Chair, but uh, we do have, uh, uh, we have started partnering with the Angel One Network uh, locally to bring in some of that uh, venture capital aspect uh, to, to uh, some of the companies uh, locally, especially from the IT side. Um, but uh, there, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of big pots of money out there. We do put them in touch with uh, FedDev Ontario uh, when the opportunity is there, depending on the size of the company, but uh, and there are some uh, other ones through uh, EMC uh, and other organizations that they can apply for smart funding. But again, it's very, uh, unfortunately, it's very specific to the type of enterprise that they're, they're going into. Uh, where we, if you're a retailer or commercial business, there generally isn't much if you're an IT related business that are specific programs that relate to that. So it's, it really depends on the type of uh, business that you're in. Sure. Would it be worth their while to do assessment and where we see, see a, maybe a hole that it needs to be filled and then? Well, no, once we identify it, then the question is where we go with, with it. But I think it would be important just to have, obviously there's some holes that need to be filled in regards to uh, providing opportunity for businesses that are, new, especially new businesses, that are medium or, or, or small. So uh, uh, it sounds to me that you, a lot of the, the, the programs are specific to specific niches and so forth. So I don't know where the holes are. I think I'm finding them, uh, fortunately, but uh, uh, through the experiences with others. But it would be kind of nice to see, okay, well, it would be nice if we can focus this at, at some point in time. We can certainly go back and uh, provide you with a, a comprehensive list, both from the small to, to the large type of funding, and see where those holes may be. Uh, maybe that discussion is with Glenn Norton, and sure that absolutely, absolutely yes. it's also yes. Why don't we take that as just a uh, staff director, and you'll come back to us when you... Uh, Why would you share this with Ms. Gold? Yes. Yeah. Councilor Pasuda. Thank you, Chairman Powers. Um, Way back when we had public delegations to the Fiber Chain of Commerce Union, and I was there, and first an executive director, and he, there was emails back and forth to concerns, and I believe for the three of Mr. Chair, Chris, you had met with them. Did, did you iron out all those concerns, or is it still something to stand in? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, actually, I, I think we got a great dialogue with, with the Fiber Chamber. Uh, they, uh, we met once, uh, him and I, uh, he, 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 uh, after the last meeting where where he was uh, concerned that we didn't address their concerns. He gave me uh, a, a new copy of their presentation that they delivered, asked me to go back. Uh, what the Debbie and I committed to is that we would take his presentation, uh, we'd go through all the all the elements, all of our actions, and see where, where they cross-referenced. We then met with him, went through it verbally, and then I did respond to him, but can anybody see both the chair and yourself on the on a formal response back to him. I believe we've ironed out um, most of, let me kind of back here. I don't believe, uh, it, their concerns tend to be fairly site specific, and they tend to be in two areas. Uh, and there's two areas that we as staff don't really have a, a, an answer that, that he likes or, or, or that the community likes. The first is they, they want a complete moratorium on, uh, on uh, enforcement of bylaws within the rural area. And as staff, we, we, have, we do not support that, that position as far as doing that. Um, and the second uh, is that um, they, they wanted to, um, uh, uh, I'm blanking now on the, uh, on the second major item. That is actually the, the key item. Some of the others were very site specific to the businesses in question. And if we, we didn't have specific uh, answers as to whether or not uh, it was right or wrong because we were, on this process, we were dealing with it from a point of overall. I think what we have done is we've opened up the dialogue and said to them that this isn't the beginning, uh, sorry, this isn't the end of this process, but that the dialogue can continue. 
Um, I haven't received any formal response back from uh, the Chamber uh, or Aaron verbally after I sent out the email, so I do not know, I can't give you a formal answer as to whether or not he agrees with my uh, synopsis that I sent out or not. Okay, thank you for that, and I have a few other items. Uh, sure, Matt, please. So on uh, agriculture, rural and agriculture needs 11.1 here, and uh, talks about the official Rural official plan contains policies for on farm economic development opportunities. And it states in here that uh, quarter four is the uh, 2013. So this is still ongoing then, as far as policies looking done on agricultural properties, as far as. So, Mr. Chair, that will be part of the rural development through your security counselor that implements the recently approved uh, rural official plan. So, as we bring forward a draft, the rules to implement that. That's our target date, basically, to try and get that to be. That's what we're working towards. So, so we deliver the draft to you by the end of So, within the next by end of the year, we're we 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 hopeful that we can have a draft for, for, for discussion. Okay, and then 11.2, and I'm going the wrong way here. 11.2 talks about uh, expertise for the rural business facilitator. Do we have somebody on board? Is that Joe or? Who would that be? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman Johnson. Joe Gravina has been our, our representative on that uh, particular committee. The other thing we're looking at and, and discussing is uh, whether or not we can realign our planning teams to get a more rural urban split so that they'll have some particular staff that are just for, for rural planning. So we're looking at the the activity levels to see whether or not it makes sense to be able to read the scriptures to get that already done. But Joe Verdian has been our identified goal person as a business facilitator. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, I'm hearing I'm liking so far, and also somebody with some rules stuff. So, it's going to be a It's going to be a real It's going to be a real Another question. <laughs> so, maybe this is being too fine detail, but this one's for Ed. Uh, and do we have, in the building department, do we have somebody that's an expert on farm buildings and residential buildings or commercial? Is there somebody that understands the farm building? And, and there's two different codes, I believe. Okay. Uh, through the chair to the council, we have a number of different teams in the building section. We have small housing, and we have large industrial ICI buildings. And we'll have diversity, diversity in farm buildings and the size. Small pole barns and small group are going to be an engineer. They're going to be the engineer drawings. I don't have any issues with those that we have here, so I'd love to hear about it. No, thank you. Okay. <laughs> so, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Because it's something that I'm a very cultural background as well. It's an important to me, so. Um, Mr. Chairman, we're still finding issues, and, and I hate to say it, I'm from the rural area and, and uh, farmer and sheep growers. And I have to yeah. babysit some of these people. I mean, not only the residents that come in or the farmers. But also, I got to work with staff. I, mean, I go to the planning department, to the building, and then I get approval. The planning department, the building department says, "No, you can't do that." Then the emails start flying at nighttime, and we get pretty nasty back and forth. And then finally, and, and I work with staff well, and staff work it out. But it's just the message that's getting out into the community that the city's not open for business, they're not willing to help or listen to agriculture and the needs out there. So we're going to continue to work on. I know we'll get through all of this and, and uh, through this community and individual discussions offline and I think we're going to move forward on this. So I have a good feeling about it, but it's taking so much time to get through this. And he would ask, and we had made the commitment, that an item of rural issues would be something that would be discussed on an as-needed basis where staff brought something forward that required us to give consideration. It would appear on the agenda. If there's things that you think we should consider, um, don't hesitate to bring them up, and, uh, and we'll ensure that they're on a uh, on a uh, uh, an agenda in the future. Look forward to that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Further, Councilor right in. One thing I forgot to mention. Um, I hope for, and this is mostly on the planning side and the environmental side. There seems to be inconsistent messaging. So uh, when somebody comes in, they'll get told one thing from one section, and then go to another section, <laughs> told something different, and it becomes confusing. And in some cases. We got a woodlot that was completely wiped off the face of the earth as a result of misinformation being communicated. So I want to ensure that that uh, the different branches on any development of land and so forth 
there is uh, a consistent message to whoever they're dealing with. Um, I mean, the, the Chichenzo is a good example where something got messed. messed. So I just hope uh, uh, that that you know the left and the right are talking and, and providing the same advice and the same um, uh, standards because uh, it, it, uh, we are situation is a mess. So should we take the chair? Sure. Okay. Um, I want to I want to thank everybody. What I particularly like is the chart is is, is readable. Um, We've got, ideally, timelines when we started, where we're going to. What I particularly like is the identified leads. If there's anything that's come out of this, and what, what started, remember, at the very first meeting in that, we did some pushback right at the very beginning is, you know, we're a team, we're not silos, and you gotta get out of your silos if you're gonna resolve this particular thing. So what I kind of, what I really like here, Deb and, uh, and, and, and Chris, is, you know, who the point people are on that particular issue. So, you know, we can, act, you know, if it comes down to Q4 of, uh, let, let's take 12-1 for an example. If it comes down to Q4 of the end of the year next year and uh, and nothing's been done, well then we can wrap Guy Paparella and Tony Sergi on that particular issue because, you know, what the heck you've been doing and whatever the case is. So pe people are going to be accountable um, um, to us from that standpoint and then kind of uh, um, your further approvals that are required as, uh, as we go. The discussion started with Chris and Deb was that um, um, I think in our short one year, I think we we collectively, all of us, I mean, at times, I mean, we we went from a, an hour to 90 minutes to two hours from a small room to a medium-sized room to a large room in that because it was one of the places to be on an as needed basis and that I think we've we've uh, uh, made good inroads in our in our first year. But we're not finished and uh, as indicated we'll we we'll meet at least twice a year and if there's a requirement to meet sooner rather than later we uh, you know we will we won't pass this by. Uh, those of us that are members of this committee from a council standpoint, you know we've got two years left and uh, and I think one of the things that we want to leave from this this term of council is kind of a, a collective legacy of all of us around the table, including ourselves, and that, that we you know made a, a dent into it. Um, Deb, I'm going to suggest that this is a good news story. I think this is something that we need to to package and we need to to to, to get out to the media to tell the stories. I think the uh, when given approval by council. These should be uh, um, disseminated to all members of council and be on the web page to kind of see where we're going so people say, well, what the heck are you doing on dealing with these particular issues? We can point to uh, to this as, as uh, you know, we've listened and we're, we're trying to do something about it. So uh, thank you to thank you to everyone and, and including the committee members for their involvement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that. Thank you, everyone. Um, we have a number of motions to deal with on this particular issue. Um, the issue for Mr. Tom Bonge is, uh, is, is an item that we uh, need to receive as correspondence and it should be referred to staff as part of the discussion to item 10.1. Collins, Whitehead on the motion, all those in favor? Carrier. Any further questions or discussions on the presentation? A motion to receive the presentation. Ferguson. Pearson on the motion, all those in favor? Gary, and a motion on the report. Pasuda, Pearson, on the motion. All those in favor? Carrier, carry. Is this your Mr. Chairman? You're going to have those two items you talked about on the agenda. Yes, sir. Yep, correct. Item 6.1 is the business licensing fee review. The report is before you, and there is a read the, the motions that you've given the item. So I need a motion to receive information report PD1104G. There's a number of reports attached to each other. So the, the very back of your stuff is 6.1. 6 so I got 6.1. Yeah. I don't think 
There's an information report that one is the information report and attached to it as appendix A is a report that was reported from planning. So I need to receive the information report and approve the planning. The, the, Six point one is G. What read it to us, Council Wayne? What's it looking for? No. What's the heading? Date and the heading? Date is uh One that actually has 6.1 up in the top corner. Okay, what's the pleasure committee? Councillor Pierce said. The report, Mr. Chairman? It, it yeah. is a motion to receive the information report, report yes. G. Receive it? So Pearson Collins on the motion. All in favor? Very. May I have a motion on the amendment to report PD 1104? F, which is Appendix A, and which was referred from the Planning Committee. Moved by Collins. So this is, okay. 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 Moved by Collins, seconded by Pearson. Okay, Councilor Pearson. The amendment is here. It's um, yellow pages. Ferguson? Yeah, so there's two of them reports here. One of them looks like it does a variance report on the original proposal cost recovery and fee approved by committee. Uh, and then there's another one showing that the, the 2012 proposed fees compared to the. Yeah, there's. Um, yeah. It's confusing. It is confusing. Yeah. This is the information. I got that. Yeah. yeah. And this is the one that was referred from. Um, and this, this has a tab as appendix A, which is a variant report to full cost recovery. Right. So we're, we're uh, dealing with this appendix A here. The, these recommendations, they were referred from planning. Which includes that appendix A. Which yeah, includes which includes that appendix A. And, and they're just asking that this be added. Mr. Fletcher, you want to just speak to the amendment, please, just for clarity? Sure, the, the amendment E that is being proposed. Maybe I'll just talk about what you have here first. Yeah. So the report PD 1104F, which is the first appendix A, is the report that was referred back to Open for Business for uh, the information report that's attached on how we came up with the fees. Attached to that, the second report that Councillor Ferguson was talking about was an appendix to that F report in that it was the first report that went in January dealing with the fees. So if we go backwards, we started in the January report, that went to Council in that January report they approved, Council approved 24 licenses to have their fees increased. There were 67 licenses left over. The report that went in August was a proposed phase-in program for those 67 licenses. That report was referred back to Open for Business. The information report talks about how we came up with the cost recovery as directed by Council. So the motions that uh, Ida has spoken to were just to receive the information report which gives the background on how we came up with things, the licenses or the uh, cost recovery, and then the report F with the amendment of E should be approved, which allows full cost recovery of the business licenses. That E was included because the user fee bylaw that went yesterday did not include the 24 licenses that were approved in the January report. It's all tied up together in this report here so that uh, everyone knows the business license inside and the increases, including the corporate increase that was approved by Council. 
we report up with this one and ultimately find its way to council that blends everything all together. Right. Council for Is the fees, so I don't have to go through and compare line by line only because they're not in the same particular order because it sounds like you're only addressing on the G report the, um, the ones that are going through a phase in approach to get to full cost pricing, whereas the F report is all licenses. Uh, is it safe to assume that looking at 2012 based on G and F, it's the exact same number for 2012? Through the chair, the report that went in January approved the 24 licenses for full cost recovery. Council also approved a percentage increase on the remainder of the licenses, which have been charged through 2012. The phase in fees of the, the difference between the council approved fees for the 67 licenses and the full cost recovery starts in 2013. So if we support this report today, are we approving a bar nightclub increase of 118%? Or is that already done? Uh, and, and I just picked one of them. Yeah. Through the chair, the fees that are attached to the G report, or sorry, the F report, which starts with uh, 60, it says 67 partial cost recovery license fees. Mm -hmm. Those are the fees that are being increased you approve them now, that improves, approves the 67 licenses for full cost recovery with the phase in of five years. Okay. G? G out of G, there were 24 licenses approved back in January at full cost recovery. There's more licenses in G than are shown in F because that's the full list of all business licensing fees that we charge as a city as part of the user fee body. Have we already approved G? Or is this G and F both, both reports being asked for approval today? Marty? So, through Mr. Chairman, so in 2001, Council endorsed a cost recovery approach for business licensing. And we're 11 years later now. 11 years later, we came back in early 2012 and said, here's a new schedule with full cost recovery for all of the license categories. Planning Committee approved full cost recovery for 24 of them. The other 64, they said, bring back a phase-in strategy. We weren't sure if we wanted to do full cost recovery, bring in a phase-in strategy. We brought the phase-in strategy back to the remaining 67. They referred it here to bring back our cost, our cost calculation method and, and a comment in this room. Because Mr. Chairman, what jumps off the page at me? If we're looking at places that are used with 80% increase, you know, the, and it's just, you know, 302 percent bought supply drop product. <laughs> <laughs> Second hand shop, 312 percent. No. Those are pretty tough things to swallow. So again, Mr. Chairman, you know that the the uh, with many deficiencies in the licensing program in 2007 operation, where you said you should do a cost recovery analysis, it was so broken it was hard to determine cost recovery. So once we got it fixed. 2009, 2010, we started to think about it. So yeah, there are some big increases, but there haven't been any since amalgamation, and that's the problem. That's why you, that's why council want to look at phasing in some of these bigger increases. So the phasing is recommended over five years. Okay, but do you Mr. Chairman, my last question is, you're supposed to start this in 2002, you said? This is 2012, and you're still proposing It should, be done. It should be done every couple of years from now on, two or three years. It should have always been done that way, it never was. 2007 operation review result revealed massive deficiencies in business licensing. So we're trying to catch up for many years and neglect on these fees. Again, we're recommending a five-year phase and on those big increases. All right, could I, because what, what I'll we will face, I suspect, Mr. Chairman, is well, then you're, if you're asking that much of an increase and you're you're not efficient in your in your, list, in your costs, you know, there's a editorial this morning on that the paper, but we don't look at the cost side, we look at the revenue side. We're so focused on that. Too. And this will draw criticism, and, and I'm uneasy with it, but let's see if I have to say. 
Councilor Pearson. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And, and I do recall, because I think I made the motion that this was referred back in August, and it was did the report on how we arrived at these fees because there was concerns of a lot of the, the hikes and some of the, and I remember specifically Councilor Johnson questioning the bed and breakfast increases. And these are just small pop sort of scenarios that are, you know, they're not huge revenue generators, but the, we're, we're um, pushing the fees up quite exponentially. So taking into consideration when I was thought under the bylaw here, under this motion is that we're just saying we're going to follow the same process as we do for, um, for the, uh, as the corporate policy for increasing licensing fees, but are we today approving these fees here or does this not have to go back to planning committee? Because our colleagues on planning, I'm assuming that what suggested are under the question this goes back to go to GIC because you open for business reports to GIC and we refer to their So now it goes back to GIC and not to planning. But should the fee, the, the, the referral that I had though wasn't for to open for business, it was to look at and report back on how we arrived at these fee increases. And whether we are saying that this is covering, you know, we don't know for sure. Well, how how is it that we're saying the fee is so much higher that we wanted that report? Is that part of this, or is that something else that's to come back? Through you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through the chair, I'll just be clear. It's the 24 licenses that were approved back in January. Those licenses were approved and in effect, and we've been charging those since that approval. 67 licenses, as I understood the referral, was back to open for business to talk about the methodology on how we came up with cost At the very bottom of page one, it says, discussion for planning committee related to the formula utilized to determine the cost recovery values. Right. right. So, but this is going to go down to GIC, and I guess that's a concern because it came out of planning committee. But we do report here, and we're it's just that planning committee members won't count this. As far Okay, well, we'll let it go the process because it will go to GIC and we'll deal with it as far as committee members be sure they're aware of it there. But yeah, that might be concerns. Thank you. So, why don't we just ensure there's an information item that's yes. on the planning agenda for yes. their information also? Okay, okay. thank you. So that, uh, I just want to be sure there's a continuity somewhere that we knew that's where the break became, but then there should be something to find on okay. that loop. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Collins. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I agree with the phasing. I, I think where we fall short, as the city always does, and this is across the entire organization. Oftentimes we do a poor job of communicating and explaining why these things happen. So, you know, if we just leave it to a phase in or, or were to pass the report um, when it was first presented and a business owner receives, you know, the bill and it's an 80%, 100% hike without any explanation or rationale as to why that's happened, that, that's a problem. And, and that's why I think there's that stereotype in terms of taxes and government and everything else. Oftentimes people don't understand the services that they're receiving and, and what makes up the budgets related to certain areas of the organization. So I, I was hoping that as part of this process, we would have an opportunity to meet with each of the individual sectors and certainly try to explain uh, the cost of delivering the inspection service and what goes into the administrative portion of the licensing component. And then at the end of the day, they could either choose to, to like it or not, but at least they, they understand why the municipality is looking at increases and can come to even try to maybe accept and understand um, you know, why we're proposing and why it's 80% in one category and why, why it might be 20% or the rate of inflation in others. And so I, I'm hesitant to pass this without having some kind of a, a community consultation or a education a component to it. And, and I'm not certain what opportunities exist knowing that there, we need some time to do that. Is there an opportunity for us to, to, to meet um, individually with, with each of these um, classes to, to talk about um, why that's happening and, and, and why we're proposing the fee that you've suggested. So, Mr. Chairman, if there's any urgency to deal with this today or in the near future, uh, Council did approve 500 and some odd thousand dollars in new revenues. It's in our budget. There's a budget shortfall of 412,000 because we could wait for this report. We're direction to fund it from the tax stabilization reserve. So, um, you 
know, as long as you're comfortable funding it for another year of the tax aid vision, we don't have to deal with this right now. And nothing prevents us from, from going with the rate of inflation as you've done with all other licenses. So at the very least, we could recover that cost yes. apart from the, whatever the percentage increase is for, and it's a range for each of them. Uh, yes, we would have to put something in the user fee file, but yes, whatever you'd like to make sure. If, if there's uh, committee support, I, I, I certainly think it, it warrants uh, some kind of an education or consultation process with these businesses, and it too gives them the opportunity to call or pick up the phone or email their respective counselor to let them know that they're either concerned with these increases, or in some cases they may fully accept them. So I guess Mr. what you're trying to do then is to apply the corporate increase this year, and then a phase that might not start until the following year, so we just... Well, nothing would prevent us if, if it takes three or four months to undertake the consultation. If you came mid-year, June or July, to suggest that that process has taken its, its, uh, its course, and there's an opportunity at that point in time then to, to consider these, then I, I would suggest we take advantage of that. Yeah. In but terms I, of the budget, right now there's a 412,000 efficiency. If we apply the two, whatever percent, that would come down a little bit, mm -hmm. and then we'll be going down every year after that once the phase is kicked in. Yeah, right. I'll come back to you, Chad, for a motion, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I have a slightly different take than my, my colleagues, although I do agree that we need to, uh, to engage. And we did that with the uh, rink rates uh, when I signed up the rink rate committee. So I think it's important to engage with different sectors. I guess what's important to me is that they've had a tax holiday or a fee holiday for a number of years relative to every other community in Ontario, quite frankly, or at least the comparators that you brought forward. So it's, it's not dissimilar to a guy that has, has their house assessed uh, recently and, and, and getting away with five years of uh, paying well below what he should be paying relative to his neighbor who has the same assessed house. Or any different than, uh, uh, what was the other area that we recently, uh, uh, oh, development charges. I mean, look at development charges, what should be charged in other jurisdictions. And we look at, and the city of Hamilton was like the lowest in development charges. We had to play catch up. So the reality is, is that uh, there's been a, a great holiday for many of these operators for many years. They had that benefit. So all we're doing now is trying to recoup the bloody costs. This is not about generating revenue for the city. This is about this is the cost for us to do business. You need to be pay, uh, picking up the uh, toll. So I think I do agree with the education component. I really hope part of that education component really does the preparedness so they understand and appreciate uh, what is being charged in uh, the comparable uh, communities that we refer to. Okay, so my, the motion we need to consider, and you'll come to you for a subsequent one, Councillor Collins, is the motion is to receive report, and I'm going to refer to it as F, so PD 1104F. G, G. We've already done G. We've already voted on G. That was the first motion that I asked for, a motion to receive the information report on G. We've already dealt with that. Now I'm dealing with the information report F. So motion to receive the report. Whitehead and Suda. In favor, Carrie. Councillor Collins, your direction. I would, and that's relative to the amendment. I would move that staff initiate a consultation process with the affected license categories and report back to the committee with their findings. And B, I would move that the categories listed in the appendix. Uh, that like the fees attached be increased by the rate of inflation, corporate annual, corporate annual increase, whatever that is. Second by Councillor Whitehead. Councillor Pearson, discussion? Okay. On the motion, all in favor? Carry. Carry. Motions, anyone? Notice of motion? Um, on the OBL list, there are uh, a list of items that can be received in view of things. The recommendation is that items 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, and 8 can be removed from the OBL. And your rural issues are standing agenda item for the future, Councillor Pursuit. So on the motion to adjust the OBL, all in favor? Sorry, mover. Collins, pardon? I did not include six. So items one, two, three, four, five, 
7 and 8 are to be removed. 7 is coming off. Or oh, should be. Is that not It's a different. We've got a different. We've we dealt with the formula. So now we'll have a new one. A new one, correct. Yeah. And you're going to have these two new ones too. Correct. So, so that's the OBL I'm talking about. Okay. So, um, Collins, Whitehead, on the motion, carried. Sir, Mr. Chair, thank you. Clarifying the point on the outstanding business list, whether or not it's today or at your meeting yesterday, I think what we need to understand is what it is that you want, whether we need to provide you with something on it. So. Otherwise, they just continue to be on the outstanding business list because we don't know how to actually approach it. So, for instance, um, the discussion on the uh, information that you've asked for, for Debbie about the organizations, we can certainly present that to you. But until you actually uh, make a decision or ask us for further information, on the same thing with the intergovernmental review. We don't know what it is that that you want to do with the item. So. Leaving it there is okay. We just need to have a discussion at some point down the road as to uh, how, what is the pleasure for us to actually do something with the machine. Okay. Two okay. My question number one is easy one, which is the measurement. The start for that, in my experience, the private sector is given the call. Me measure. Take a first crack. How are you going to measure whether or not we're doing this? And and uh, and then we can expand on it at a future meeting. But that would be the start. Uh, I realize some of it's subjective, and that's going to take some head scratching. How you measure a subjective measurement plate between calls of 48 hours? On the other issue, I would like to see staff prepare for us a list of key suppliers that we could vet. And, and I'm recognizing we won't support it, but we may in fact want to amend it, add to it, alter it, and ultimately put it out there as council members. Okay. Any concurrence? Okay. No Mr. Chairman, I just um, I understand where Councilor Ferguson is coming from. Has staff done any background work with other communities do with regards to this of um, providers' services? Do we know? Like, do we get it? Or I mean, I just want to know whether we're just doing this because we're doing it, or are other communities more open to say providing a list of um, contractors? Just speaking on behalf of kind of everyone, and I think everyone has other experience. I mean, that's coming directly from a, another municipality. I think the answer is no other municipality does this as a, as a collection. Like I said, we've debated it back and forth. From a personal aspect, I think the decision really is, do you want to do it or don't you want to do it? I don't mean that so so bluntly, but we can prepare you whatever you're looking for. Um, you just need to know, and that's why I'm saying I, I don't know where to go with, with the issue. I can bring you a list which has 2,000 names on it, which is the list we we bandied about internally, we can present it to you, and then ultimately though, I don't know how you get around the ultimate decision is, is that what you want to do or not? Um, okay. But I can, I can figure why, out. Why don't we take this one off? Why don't we take this offline? And turn? Well, I, I want to do it. Okay, just so I'm clear about that. And I want to be have a competitive advantage over our competing municipalities or going after the same business. I want to make it easier to do business here. Nobody's pushed back, so all 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 work with the staff to come back with something for the next game. Okay. Any other new business? Anyone? Motion to adjourn. Whitehead, Ferguson, and uh, there should be food left that. Uh, <laughs>